born in Clinton Indian Hospital on the 4th of July, 1948. And then I grew up in uh, the town of Watonga, Oklahoma. But there were seven miles out, you know, they call it out in the country, where uh, west of Watonga, where we grew up, and there was a community hall there. Second to the youngest, I have uh, three sisters and uh, four brothers. There were eight of us in the family, and they were um, my father's had his children, and my mother, and then here was um, so I had step brothers and sisters. Blended family, they call it. My father's Northern Cheyenne and Northern Rappo. His mother's Northern Rappo and his father's Northern Cheyenne. And then I was always curious, you know, well, here's my mother, Southern Cheyenne, here's my father, Northern Cheyenne and Northern Rappo. And here I am, I got enrolled under my mother as here it says Cheyenne Rappo. It was in the Library of Congress that uh, take these Indians and it had the Cheyenne to, to the reservation. If, if they don't, if they resist, kill them, exterminate them. I, I was so touched by it. And I said, but still I'm here, I'm still here. My people still here. The story I heard uh, was, that they, uh, 130 of them, and the leaders was Doll Knife and Little Wolf and North Woman. And that they, uh, someone had said that the soldiers said, you know, they, they were surrounded by soldiers. And they said, oh, let them, let them get so far, let them think that they're really escaping. And then we'll go after them. That, that really touched me, you know. And to know that they actually made it under such conditions, you know, many, outnumbered by soldiers, equipment, uh, even the, bull, um, um, the guns. They made it. How did they make it? And even the stories that I heard as this began to unfold was, oh, there was ceremonial people on the way that they, um, made medicine and they um, performed miracles. They used the elements like one, one said that um, they used the fog. The fog got in between them and the soldiers. And then another one said uh, they used the animal trails to disguise their tracks. I mean, it's so beautiful, you know? Nature and uh, Cheyenne, and, and they used, um, how they used the land, how they used the animals, and the buffalo. They had buffalo robes, and they disguised themselves as buffalo. And the soldiers passed them up. They didn't even see them. I heard there was uh, the ones that stayed behind, they, they had ceremonies that they would make it. And I really believed that. I said this had to be through ceremonies and prayers 
is why the Cheyenne is still here, Arapahoes. We're still here today because of the ceremonies and the prayer. I spent part of my time in uh, Gary, where my grandfather is from. That was 12 miles out from west of Gary. So I spent some time out in the country. And then at five years old, I was at St. Patrick's in Anadarko's at mission school, Catholic mission school. My work um, is about brokenness and uh, my people as a Cheyenne woman, I come from uh, my own experience from broken brokenness and my message is <clears throat> the uh, genocide the Cheyennes went through and uh, many um, turmoil and uh, just fighting to live uh, the history of my people. They did all that work already, you know. And so now here I am and I am working with, um, through my own experience as, uh, as, a, as a woman, as a Cheyenne woman, uh, Arapaho, the spiritual part of my um, childhood and adolescence, and then my adult as an alcoholic, uh, the brokenness, the trauma of my people uh, that I, I had come through, I believe. I came through all of this brokenness and then to reclaim myself. First time, you know, the animals are coming to to a global grandmother's gathering, and they're the horses, the rescue horses, and it is very touching to my heart that um, that somehow um, the animals, you know, the horse whisper is bringing them rescue horses, and uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, explaining and expression to do for for our life, life, sacred life here, the life uh, path, and to come to the uh, Northern Cheyenne Reservation to uh, commemorate the Cheyenne escape in 1868, when they took all the Cheyennes to, to the Indian Territory in Oklahoma and they escaped and made it back to their birthplace where I live now. And it is a very beautiful unfolding that is coming to be. So we grew up here and then we would go back and forth uh, traveling uh, to see my other grandparents in Wyoming, my father's parents, and then in Montana, Lame Deer, Montana and then uh, Arapaho, Wyoming. When I was 12 years old, I was uh, called to be in the Kid Fox, one of the sacred uh, women, girls in Kid Fox clan. In 1950, I think, and I was 12. And then um, when I, went to boarding school here at Concho. And then I graduated from eighth grade. Then I went 
to uh, Sri Lanka. Graduated from the high school from there. Uh, we had to be um, tell the superintendent at after high school what we're, if we're going to college, if we're going to go to trade school. We had to have a plan and accept it. So I got accepted in uh, Albuquerque Nursing School. And I married my, um, my husband, it was Coach de Pueblo. In between those times, we were very traditional family. So Native American church was my mother's my grandfather, so I come from, I'm third generation from that Native American church and when um, they established it. And it was, it was very important to my mother and my grandfather and his brothers and his, his uh, family, you know, and how we, how they, uh, that movement was. My mother even went to jail. My, she's my grandfather. They, they all went to jail for that religion they call it. So, I saw that from my mother. Side and um, today I still practice that. <laughs> But getting the whole picture of the Cheyenne when they migrated from the north, where from the north they came through the Great Lakes. And that's what I found that they were potters too. There was pottery. Uh, they found that the Cheyenne made. And then they, they migrated through the plains. They were peace. The, my understanding and what I studied in the research was that they were peaceful people. And, and I could say myself, you know, in the position that, I was, that I'm in, that I came through in this world movement, they were on a mission. They migrated from the north, coming from the Great Lakes to here and meeting all these tribes. Never gotten in a war with any of them. And came to the plains and made that their home in such, um, they were very, how do you say, flexible or very adaptable and very uh, courageous people. First, my grandmother, my mother taught me. My grandma would, would make dolls together. And then my mother, from my grandmother and my mother did beadwork. So I, I learned how to do beadwork. Moccasins, buckskin dress, you know, everything and a uh, woman is what they need. My uh, mother-in-law saw me making a pair of moccasins. I'll beat it. She, she saw me how I would do beadwork and how I would sell it to pay some of our bills. And, and I think she pitied me, felt sorry for me. She, she showed me. She gave it to me, you know, like a little ceremony. She took me to the mountain and she said, here's the clay. You pray over it and you use it, you find your own texture. And I um, was my teacher in making pottery. It was my other two sister-in-laws and I. So we were, we were making pottery, you know, this storyteller dolls. And I really enjoyed it. I, 
The first night I I mixed my clay, I made a hundred little ones. I had them under this plastic bag. She used to come in and house check to see we have uh, clean houses, you know. She really told us, always clean your house, you know. And my sister-in-law, we would warn each other, you know, she would say, Mom's headed to your house, you know, are you ready? <laughs> She's going to check your house to see if it's clean. And she saw these dolls. She said, what's in here? She opened it up. She said, oh, my goodness. It's like I just took off and made all these dolls, little miniature. And she grabbed my hand. She said, you've got magic hands, she said. So I started. And it was very um, therapeutic for me because it was very difficult during that time having three children, alcoholic husband, you know, and I made, I made a living like I was a single parent, you know. I believe that I had a transition in my life, an enlightenment, you know, after my struggles being married and becoming an uh, alcoholic and how I struggled through, through these uh, social problems. I became um, a substance abuse you know, counselor. I went to UNM, the psychology department, and their program, Bill Miller's, and then here was, um, I worked at Hamas. I just came to me. I'm moving to Montana to find my father's people, family, you know, his go to uh, Montana. So it was like in November. And my boss, he said, We need you here, you know. I said, No, I made, I made up my mind, I'm going. And I was in recovery, you know, for few years and my whole life changed and I was finding myself putting everything in order you know I had already um, made amends with my husband my children it was empty nest and and I came through um, alcoholism got sober and I was like in a very uh, special place in my life. Enlightenment, I guess they call it, transition. Something happened to me. I can't really explain it.
so I was staying with my daughter in Taos before I, I had my car all packed and my clothes moving to Montana. She came and she had this letter. She said, Mom, who do you know in California? That's where the letter was from. I opened it and it was inviting me to Phoenicia, New York, to, to a woman's gathering. So like, I was plucked out of my life and I accepted it and went. And there were all these people there. And I was like, wow, this is really important. Wilma Mankiller was there, Alice Walker, Glorious Time. Um, there, were, there were important women there. And there I was, and I was, you know, figuring, thinking, this is something. It was in 2004, and then we've, I found my name on this round table. And they told me to bring my regalia, you know. And then I saw, I saw the other women, the 12 women, somewhere in their regalia and somewhere just in regular street clothes. But it was quite amazing. Then we formed a council there. And our mission statement, world peace, healing Mother Earth and her inhabitants. Oh, I was just excited about that. I said, I get to be a part of this movement, work, I didn't know anything. I was like green as it, but I was fun. I was willing to. Then we started our next council. Was, we, were, we decided to become a council. We decided to go to each grandmother's home, home place, homeland, to have council. So we started this uh, Flor de Mayo. It was my own grandmother. She was living in um, New Mexico. We went to Milwaukee. Had our first council. Then Mexico. Then in Dharamsala, India. And then we went to uh, here in uh, Black Hills. And then to uh, Lincoln City, Oregon. Then we went to Japan. In between, we got invitations. I got invitations to go to um, Australia, Sweden. A lot of times, I couldn't believe that I was doing this. I couldn't believe I was meeting people in the world that were so concerned about our condition. <laughs> One grandma had this dream of 13 grandmothers. That's how we came into the world, this world movement. And the Dalai Lama said, the world needed grandmothers. And so here we were in the new millennium. You know, is this all by accident? Is this coincidental? Is this meant to happen? This happened, hey, this happened. I'm sitting right here telling you, it happened. And this little effect in all of us. I hear school teachers say, well, Grandma, I want to do that you, what you grandmas are doing. You're doing something great. What do you do? What else do you do? Oh, I volunteer at the hospital to read stories to patients. There you go. And you're a school teacher. You're teaching these children. I had great teachers. 
They taught me something. This is what I am today. They come to me, they, they ask me, how did you become global grandmother? And I tell them this, this whole uh, part of this, this full circle of life that I come back to and uh, the process. And it was all through the spirituality that I was first taught the imprint and then the uh, addiction, you know, and then coming out of it, and then now to be a, a sort of speak a professional or a ex expert on um, this, this whole uh, uh, coming to resilience, you know, and, and how beautiful this uh, work is that I'm doing as global grandmother. And it is uh, through every effort in, in the physical world as well as the spiritual. And that the, the whole uh, beauty of it and the resilience is that I'm able to talk about this, that I'm able to express this about the process, you know, that my people already begin this work, you know, fighting to live in the plains, you know, as Cheyenne people. In Alaska, when we were at our council meeting, this Cherokee lady, she wanted to do a ride from White, uh, Red Clay, Tennessee, to here, to the Trail of Tears, to um, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And uh, then pick it up from there, from Oklahoma to to Montana and arrive at my my council meeting, 13 grandmas. So there was the horse riders, the horses waiting to go, volunteers waiting to, to begin this ride, historical ride. So we started from here, from Fort Reno. It was so amazing, so, so pitiful to me, so heart, heartfelt, you know, that all these riders came, there were 18 of them and five horses, four Mustangs. They had a whole year to train these Mustangs, wild Mustangs. And, and you know, there were rescue horses. And Tess, the last horse came it was a Morgan. And I heard these, it touched me because even now when I talk about these horses being rescued, they had like a number on their necks. I said, like me, I have my enrollment number. Native Americans have enrollment numbers. I saw that. And then um, Tess came. She's a Morgan. And they said, Grandma, oh, Adrian Youngblood, she said, Grandma, I want you to write Tess, she's a Morgan. And I told her, I said, what is a Morgan horse, you know? And she said, Morgan horses are real, very good horses. She said, the soldiers rode these horses in the, gal uh, the cavalry, cavalry horse, cavalry. Soldiers wrote these horses, Morgans. You know, here was the history of the soldiers, you know, the white people killing us. And there was something very uh, peculiar, you know, when we started on the ride and here was the Morgan horse and here was these rescue horses and here was these white people and here was only two uh, Cheyennes riding the horse and different other tribes. And right away I thought to you, what are my Cheyenne people gonna think, you know, on this ride? There's no, they're not all Cheyennes. I said, well, th you know, this is the Mahayana's way, Mahayana's way, God's way, it's not mine. I'm just gonna go along with it. I'm gonna walk with it. I'm gonna let it tell me something, show me something. That was, I finally let go of myself and the way I saw things. And I said, okay, I'm letting it unfold. I want to see them folding. I 
began seeing all the um, focus on such hardship and, you know, the genocide and comparing it to now, today, to where I'm at. And that, that was, that was the beauty. I work with a lot of young people and wanting them to really uh, experience the, their the life, you know, and, and I really believe that their young people are really going to save themselves, you know. Uh, they are really uh, a generation that are um, asking questions, you know, and finding the answers. <laughs> Now here, here I am, and uh, given the opportunity to express this process and uh, step by step, and I do this with the young people at home, and uh, they really get it, and they really there's you know a generation that really understands this and come to appreciate even the history and wanting it, to hear the history from an elder from from a person who has seen the edge, you know, and plus understand the whole traumatic uh, process of our existence as indigenous people all over the world. This is my understanding, of my purpose, and seeing uh, what they call full circle, the full circle, and uh, ex using this as the uh, the vision of of living a well, full life in the in the spiritual sense. So this is what I'm very involved with and very focused on. Uh, as my grandmother gave me the uh, understanding and teaching of reading uh, fire. So that would be the theme of my fire, which to her expression, meaning uh, was about life. You know, if you watch the fire and uh, the flame and then the coals that it makes, um, middle-aged life is like where I'm at. And uh, what is this? Uh, fire mean and it's 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 in the sun and it's in the middle of this planet earth it has significant meaning to the Cheyenne people it is uh, such a um, energy uh, an energy that is in every human being to and the create creativity so this is my expression about um, my work in the world, and it's uh, very beautiful to use this element, very powerful element.